<laughs> Jan and I were talking about that last night about um, our mark on the world. You know, what, what you know, are, are we doing? There's a church song, Have I Done Any Good in the World Today, that we always grew up in. And, um, that's what we were talking about. But, you know, besides wanting to be known as a, a really good painter, we want to be known as, as people that help people on their journey of, of becoming um, better artists. I think both of us had really incredible instructors that we studied from um, that just gave it up their all and never, um, never held anything back. So it was a good, um, a good role model for, for each of us to continue on that journey of helping the next generation. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here painting for you. Um, I am, I, we're going to have some already audience participation. Besides, feel free to ask questions, take photos. I just ask that you make sure you get my good side. <laughs> but, um, I, so I have, um, I do paint mainly for life, especially in the summertime. I am a painting maniac um, in June when the, my roses start blooming. Um, I will paint, I will start two or three paintings a day, uh, get a, a really good block in, a, a good start on you know, one painting and then move to another because I'm, um, I'm just a matic painter during the rose blooming season. Um, and then when the roses slow down, then, then I will go back to those paintings that I started from life and, and tweak them. And a lot of times I, um, I am really pretty prolific and I'm a pretty fast painter. Um, years and years ago, I did wall murals for a living. And I, that was one thing Shannon and I found out we had both common, we both did wall murals and home finishing. And that was big in the, in the 90s. And time was money, so I learned to paint. And now you're told painting. Yeah, I, well, I started out in the decorative art world. Don't say told painting. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, my brother, <laughs> he will be the, the major heckler of the day. <laughs> I did have a question. Go ahead. Who's your favorite brother? <laughs> <laughs> I have three brothers. <laughs> Rob is my oldest, and he was my protector when I was a little girl. Um, I have another brother that passed away. Five, four, five years, five years, six years, six years ago. Um, and then a little brother. You are by far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're still in the way. Rob's a lawyer, so he takes care of all of our, our lawyer questions. Uh -huh. Um, I'm really a frustrated artist. Yeah, it's true. He is. He, he's actually a really talented artist, but his our dad told him he could never make a living in art, so he became a lawyer instead. And I needed to prove my dad wrong, so here I am. Someday, if I make enough money, I'll be able to afford it. But that's, that's, that's <laughs> so not true. Let me tell you. Anyway, um, where was I? Did I lost my. Your mark on the Oh well, yeah, I started in decorative painting. Um, this was, I was like 20, 20 years old. My mom had taken a toll painting class. And she said, come on over. I had taken drawing in college. Let's just start there. And I've always, we, we come from a very talented, creative family. I will say that. And so I was always making things. Like when I was eight years old, I was eight, nine years old. I was making little shadow boxes with dried flowers and walking around our neighborhood and selling them for $5. I was an entrepreneur back when I was just a kid. Um, and, uh, but you know, everything that I did kind of centered around flowers. My grandmother's love of flowers, and I loved and adored my grandmother. I think that's where, you know, my love of flowers come in. Um, but in the decorative art world, I, I have written six books on decorative art where I created my own designs, chairs, mirrors, fireplace mantles, that kind of thing, and then people would buy my, my patterns. That I, and I got to a point in the decorative art field that I felt like I just, I had reached, there was nowhere else for me to go. I was at the top and I was still hungry for more. And um, because the decorative art field is kind of really limited in what they consider good art. And I just knew there was more. So I um, uh, actually started out, uh, well, I started out in acrylics, then did watercolor. And then as soon as I picked up oil paint, that was it for me. I just knew that was what I absolutely wanted to do. Um, I studied with a master decorative artist in Kansas, Mary Jo Leisure, who is an incredible designer. Um, her color sense is incredible. Temperature shifts. She's just a, a beautiful person inside and out. And then I studied with a portrait artist in Pittsburgh. I lived there for 24 years, Robert Daly. Um, so I was really focusing on painting portraits when I first started out. When I was 
moving into the, into the fine art world and because I wanted to paint my children. And um, I started getting commissions for other people's children. I quickly realized I didn't like painting other people's children nearly as much as I liked painting my own. Um, and this is my kid. What? Unless it's my Unless, yeah, I, I painted a lot of my nieces and, and nephews many times. But um, you keep interrupting me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say I had a bad night last night. I did not sleep well. I, I had a really hard time calming my brain down from last night. And um, anyway, so I'm, I'm a little discombobulated as my mother. But you, you trained with Daly in Pittsburgh. I trained with, yeah, Robert Daly, so I didn't like painting other people's children. And he said to me one time, you know, you're so good at flowers, because that's what I focused on in the Decker Park world. He said, why don't you do a still life? He said, I don't have like any desire to do a still life. He said, you know, you're so good at flowers, just try a still life. So he finally convinced, convinced me, I set up a still life and went, oh, okay, <laughs> all right, this is what I want to do. So, um, but if you don't know uh, about me, I grow all the flowers in my paintings. Um, I have over 100 rose bushes, peonies, uh, peach tree, apple tree, uh, daylilies, uh, grapevines, blackberries, raspberries, I, I just blueberries. I just, I have a wide, a huge garden and I get less and less grass every single year and I've already started moving into Shanna's yard. Planting <laughs> roses in Shanna's yard. Shanna and I are literally next, literally next door neighbors and uh, it's, it's pretty cool to have a, a painting companion that's on the same level as you are, that we do totally different genres, totally different styles. There's no jealousy, jealousy between us at all. It's just really, we're both blessed to have found each other and continue on this journey together. Um, anyway, so that's that's basically, you know, my story. Um, I can, if you're interested in more, I'll tell you more about it as, as we go. Uh, my easel is the new Soltec, if you're wondering. Um, they came out with a new Soltec this, this past year, and they redesigned it. Um, I, I'm not going to take it apart now because I, I've tightened everything. Um, but the, the old set, Soltec came out this way, and uh, everybody told them to make it you know, this way, which they did. But, so this is, this is actually the new Soltec, but the palette for today is a little bit too small. So this is the palette from the last Soltec that I just clipped on there. I've got a, just a really traditional palette, titanium white, cad lemon, cad yellow, medium. Now, most of these are gamblins uh, paints, so that's cad yellow medium, this is cad orange, cad red, yellow ochre, raw umber, transparent earth red, um, quinacridone, is it quinacridone rose? Quinacridone, I forgot mine, so I'm already shows. Alizarin, French ultramarine, viridian, phthalo green, which I don't use a lot. Um, I, I use it if I'm doing some of my really jade jars. I can find this paint, this color really helpful and gets me quicker to where I want to be as opposed to Viridian. Viridian is a pretty weak tinting paint and they will, like little goes a really long way. <laughs> um, and Ivory Black. I've got Gamsol as my solvent and oh, my knee on the gilt. So you can see here that all the paints fit in there. You can put your brushes here. This is the tricky part, make sure you get this on here so it doesn't fall. So, um, audience participation. Um, so, I, I'm not going to paint from life, I'm going to paint from a photo. I do take a lot of photos of my setups. Um, when I in the summertime, so that I can paint from my own flowers in the wintertime. I have I don't have any connection to Flora's flowers. I have a connection to my flowers. There's a love affair. My brother says, you know, Liz, there's a lot of people that love flowers, and then there's you, you take it to a whole different level. And um, it's probably true, but I, I have a love affair with my flowers. I I take care of I water them, I weed them, I feed them, I talk to them. People say, How do you get your roses to grow so so good, and I oh, they're so pretty. <laughs> I literally go out there and talk to them. Um, but, so I have two of the images, and we're going to take a vote to see which one I paint. So I have um, this. This I did this one for Scott Jones because I know he. I did this once before, and he loved this painting. So this is my jade jar with some roses called Love Song. So there's this one, um, or bring up the other one. So this one. Yes. 
Or there's this one. So this is roses and peonies in a copper vessel. So raise your hand if you want me to do this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And uh, raise your hand if you want the J jar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The copper. So, well, did I count you? Oh, you're voting for both? <laughs> <laughs> you should be in both hands. You'll have to do two demos. You're going to have to do two demos. I am pretty fast, but I don't know if I can get two done. So. All right, so the copper has it. I think Shanna's happy as well with that. Am I right, Shanna? Uh -huh. This for those of us who are primarily watercolors, what's Neo McGill? So Neo McGill, it's um it's a medium um, made by Gamble and it's a fast, fast drying medium. Like Shannon said yesterday, I used to use liquid all the time, but you get a headache. So Gamblin is a company that is very conscious about our health, and that was you know their whole goal was to make more health conscious products for us oil painters. So it's um, a low odor, fast drying medium for oil painting. Right? Oh, I gotta show you a picture of my granddaughter. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to post any pictures oh, on, on social media because my son, um, they said no, no pictures of George on social media. Yeah. She's just the cutest little girl. Yeah. Yes. Oh, there you go. You can paint her. Yeah, you could paint. You find it well well I get started. I am um I painted Rob's dog his youngest daughter, uh Caitlin is we call her an old soul. This is just not standing as well as I like it. Um we call her an old soul. She is just beautiful inside and out, timeless beauty. And so I painted her and what best in show at the mm -hmm. National Oil and Coat Painter Society. Mm -hmm. And um, he keeps wanting to buy it and he's never offering me enough money yet. So <laughs> it's I, she's never named a price. Capital <laughs> zeros to whatever you pay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will tell. So she's I never so my iPhone today gave me a movie memory of a trip to Paris four years ago. And for some reason, I thought the painting of my daughter was, was a, a French master. And it showed up in the video. How cool is that? Huh? Rob has an incredible art collection. He just doesn't really collect my work. Because <laughs> they were gifts. No, I paid for one price. Because <laughs> I lost a bet. That's a whole other story. You still got it cheap. <laughs> All right. I'm sending you that. Okay. All right. So I, um, I'm i one that doesn't like to, um, I don't start every painting exactly the same way every single time. I'm, I'm one that really loves the search of stuff. That's the start in the middle is the most favorite fun part for me when I'm doing when I'm painting. And so I don't like to start with a really defined sketch or anything like that. A lot of times I'll just mask in colors and, and, and start to find shapes and things as I go. So but with this one, I think what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna just use some alizarin. I'm gonna put that down with my damsel. Um, and I'm just gonna come up here and just kind of think where what are the the boundaries of what this is going to be. So basically, yeah. Sorry, um, That's it. Can everyone see okay? You've got the view of my butt. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> So I do want to make sure there's enough breathing room at the top of the frame. Um, so I'm just going to be here. That main, that main peony. Um, this rose, this, this deep fuchsia color is a, it's called Munstead Wood. It's one of my favorites. I 
and look to your substrate. Um, so this is Clausen's 15 um, that Shanna's husband mounted on her gator, gator board, and I, and I turned it a couple days ago. I, when I, uh, whenever I'm probably doing a darker background, I'm going to turn the canvas first and let that dry so that I can get to that darker background easier. Um, so this is just what I'm going to be on a few days ago, so it's, it's completely dry. Um, and I <coughs> put a lot of petals. She, Marco's, Marco's husband, Shanna's husband, Marco, comes over and, and he'll bring over the panels and stuff and he'll see where my area where I set up my, my still life. And, I mean, there's just debris everywhere. And he starts cleaning it up because that's what he does. He just cleans up after us. I said, leave it alone! That's not part of the thing. He's got to clean that shit up. <laughs> so, Red Steers, but the setup is actually gorgeous. Can you talk a little bit about how you put together and what your approach to composition is? So I was once told, never put your base in the center. <laughs> I'm the type of person that says, really? Watch me. Um, so uh, I don't mind putting my base in the center because my, you know, my base isn't the focal point. My focal point's going to um, be up here. And I'm never thinking about, well, I have to have three red roses and five, you know, the odd number kind of thing. I'm, I'm not thinking that. I'm literally, I'm more of an intuitive person rather than an analytical person, if that makes sense. So, you know, I'm putting things in. I'm looking for um, a connected color shape where I, I'm not going to go white, pink, white, pink, white, pink. Um, if you look, see, you see, I have this beautiful kind of sweep of the light color, and the pink colors are more congregated together. Does that make sense? So a lot of times I'll just take the flowers and I'll stick them in the base, and the still life gods are are <laughs> working that day, and it's just beautiful, just like that. A lot of times you can ask Shannon, I'll spend quite a bit of time arranging things. The two paintings that I have um, that I brought for you to see as well. Um, the the sunflower the dried sunflower cut painting I, that looks like I just put them in there but I, that really actually took me a lot of time to get that rhythm that I wanted um, and I am looking for rhythm of things this this connected quality between lights and darks or, or color families does that make sense? Um, you said that she's a fast painter I will attest to the fact that sometimes it takes more time on the setup. Mm -hmm. That's that probably well so. I have to work out all, most of my problems in my composition in the setup. So that's why I do. I spend on, once I get that done, then I know half my battles won. Um, I'm also not one that uh, will, like, I can visualize exactly how I want this painting to look in the end stages. I'm not that person. Again, I loved the search. I have, I have no idea how this painting is going to look out look at, at when I'm done painting, but that's the excitement part for me. I love that. I don't like having a very finished perception of what this is going to, to look like, because then you're telling the painting what it should be instead of you listening to the painting and it's going to tell you what it wants to be. So, and I know that sounds strange, but they really do talk to you. The paintings have energy. So, I think I'm going to be Okay, so once once I have this, then this is like a really rough one. I'm going to come in here with a bigger brush. And I didn't bring any Indian yellow. I wish I had some Indian yellow. But I'm going to start with the alizarin. And this first stage, I'm always using Gamsol just to get the paint really thin. Um, and like the lighter pink uh, peonies, instead of trying a different color, I just use more Gamsol so that the, the color is lighter. I'm, this is a stage where I don't normally try, I try not to use a lot of white, although I've got white flowers, so I probably will use, but I'm keeping the paint pretty thin. Um, I'm going to come in here with, I love Viridian and Transparent Oxide Red for a dark green. I think it just makes a really nice warm dark. Um, I set up my, my paintings with a 5,000 Kelvin, which is what this is. This is 5,000 K. 
And so I have a light mounted on my ceiling that shines down. It's the same light that hits my still light. It's the same light that hits my canvas. And that's really important that you don't have a cool light on your setup and you got a warm light on your, on your um, palette that's right on your canvas because that's going to totally um, throw you. Elizabeth, you may have already said this, but I know you work primarily like 90% from life, but then don't, do you also photograph, well, you can photograph them, but how does that work in your process? So I do take a photograph because I, I might not be able to finish it from life, so then I can always refer back to the photo. Okay. But again, there comes, just like what Jeremy said and what Shanna said, there comes a point in time where it doesn't even matter what's going on in the photograph. It, it matters what's happening here, and you make decisions based on what's, what's happening there. Except to use an iPhone or a camera. I have a Nikon D7500 is my, is my camera that I use. It takes really, it takes really good um, photos. So I'm picking up now um, transparent oxide red, a little bit of French ultramarine for the darks of the copper. Um, the lady that I studied with, Mary Jo Laser, she gave me this copper vessel, and I absolutely love it. You can see, uh, you know, I painted it over there. I love copper; is probably my most favorite metal to paint. I love painting metal, but copper is probably number one. Brass and then silver. And those these paintings are for sale, right? Um, not the big one. Okay. I'm saving that. <laughs> I'm taking now transparent earth red cat orange and a little bit of raw umber to kind of dull it to get the a little bit more orange. Throw in a little bit of iridium for that plain shade right here so it's a little bit greener. Um, I attack a painting like this because at this point I have no fear and I know anything that I do can always be corrected. I think fear is, is one of your greatest um, weaknesses that's going to hold you back the most if you're afraid. And, you know, I've taught for so many years and students always say, well, I'm afraid. I said, well, it's just paint. There's no paint police that come and arrest you if you, if you make a, um, a wrong yeah. decision. I told the students that. And I thought it would be funny for us to do this get her dressed up like the police and I. <laughs> <laughs> paint police! Paint police! You're holding your brush wrong! <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm going to take a little bit of white. And do you ever mix large pools of paint, or are you just pretty much working back and forth? I am. I brush? am a blender on the pipe. The only time I'll mix a big pile of paint is if I have a big painting and I know I'm on the background for release. Mm -hmm. Subtle color, then I'll do that. But um, though I, I just studied with people that never did that, mm -hmm. that helped knife mix puddles. That was never in my wheelhouse as a student. And I and I love the mixing part. I love coming up with colors and the little subtle sh the shifts that you can get by blending. I used to watch Helen Van Wyck all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know when she was on TV, and she used to say, "You want to make salsa, not mush," and that <laughs> that resonated with me. So this is going to be this white. White flowers are can be difficult because white's a cold color. Um, but if you start to cold, the flower will look um, dead. So you have to start a little bit warmer than most people think when it comes to white flowers. 
because you're going to continue to add more white and it's going to get colder and colder. So no, I actually, if I had Indian yellow, I probably would um, mask those in with a really, really thin Indian yellow because it's such a pure, um, beautiful color when mixed with white. It does, that Indian yellow comes through and just makes the petals really feel translucent. Do you use a, uh, when you have your set up at home, do you use a light box? Or, I mean, do you put it into a box? Um, sometimes, it depends if I want. So I have two sizes of box, and, and on, um, so we've got some cards on Inspired to Paint here, if you're interested in seeing, but on Inspired to Paint, if you go, if you, if you click on my instructor's Elizabeth Robbins, and you scroll down, I've got my a materials video that's for you to watch, and how I set up the still light. So that's there. So I have two different sizes of still light box. One's about this big, and another one's for a, a smaller one. Um, when we film, I do put it in the box because we have secondary light that's for filming purposes, and that box helps take care of, eliminate that secondary light, light source. Does that make sense? And that's on Inspired Paint. InspiredPaint.com. I, when we when we first uh, talked about doing it, I we came up with that name, and I said, Shannon, there's no way that domain is going to be available. Um, I couldn't believe it when it was. Okay. So I'm still, this is still kind of my drawing, making sure I've got my drawing fairly good. Um, and this is a, we have a family member that at this point would always say, I have a hard time believing that's going to turn out to be a painting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I do like to start with the base, for, even though, even when I'm painting from line, I like to get a good light and shadow um, pattern going on the base because I feel it's the anchor of the painting. So I get, I'm going to work on this. I might come in here and put a few little strokes of value background. I'm going to use black ochre and maybe a little bit of a lizard. And I use this mixture a lot because between, and basically it's a red, yellow, and blue. Ivory black is a blue, yellow ochre is a yellow, and a lizard is red. So I'm using the three primaries. And depending on if I use more lizard on black, it comes out more burgundy. If I use more black and ochre, it comes more green. So he's more ochre and alizarin, it's more brown. So, you know, I'm adding lights, but between those those three primaries, I can come up with some really, a, a, a wide variety of that, uh, background choices. But I just know, right now, I just want it dark. So, and I'm not going to um, block in the whole thing. I'm just going to give me some notes. And I might lighten over here, just so that shadow side of the vessel will, um, a little bit more visible. I also, the background also tells, has an influence in some of the colors in the, the vessel. So if I decide to go a blue, then I need to put some blue in my copper. If I decide to go red, I put more red. But if I decide, I think I'm going to go with this just real kind of khaki dark green, um, gray green, then I'm going to throw some of that into my, my vessel as well. Okay, so the fun part. Um, so now this is where I might start picking that neon yellow instead of um, I predicted it out instead of camsol. So the first layer I I am always using just camsol. It's that whole um, fat over lean that you, know, you can't start too fat, adding too much medium, and then go back and thin the paint down with camsol. Um, so and I try to have two brushes, one for light and one for dark. Um, that's what helps keep my, my values cleaner. So I'm going back to my, my transparent orange red and my French ultramarine um, to come in here and reinforce some of these darks. Fun little cast shadow. So now I'm going to go back to my light brush. My bristle is my light brush because I can pick up more paint and grab more texture with the bristle. So this is a this is just a synthetic um, bristle. It's a 1AT series from Royal Brush. This is a, a Sable Tech line. It's a synthetic Sable, um, and uh, and I actually sell brushes on Inspired to Paint. But so this is just a synthetic Sable. And I've used Royal brushes for years and years and years. They were they've been really good to me. So. I'm going to go a little bit lighter 
and I'm keeping it pretty simple at this point. What are you using to make it go lighter? Um, I added, well, it was transparent on thread. I was using cattle orange, and then I picked up some cad yellow, cad yellow medium. Pick up even some, throw in some greens to kind of change the temperature of it just a little bit. Um, yesterday, during the war ceremony, I did talk a lot about how I love the little temperature shifts in paintings. I make quick, fast decisions at this stage of, uh, stage of the game. I, um, I don't worry about whether I'm, you know, the, the three questions that are always going through my head are, am I too light or too dark? Am I too bright or too dull? Am I too warm or too cold? Those are the three questions that are constantly going through my, my mind. I'm never asking, did I get the color right? As students, that's the number one question they always ask. What color are you using? That's really irrelevant, what color I'm using. What's important is what value are you using, what intensity are you using, and what temperature are you using. Whether I grab that color perfectly or not is not my goal. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, you know, like Jeremy, I like to get the highlight on there pretty soon um, because it just feels it's like having you make dessert before dinner. <laughs> it just it feels good. Lavender, alizarin blue, and white. Um, I the highlights fascinate me. Um, I have a, a concept lesson that's hard to paint just about highlights, and, and what I'm doing now is you see I'm putting a cool lavender. This is what I call the aura around the highlight, and I'm trying to make this really shiny. And in order to do that, I need I need vibration. And so when you put a cool on top of a warm or a bright on top of a dull kind of thing, it, it vibrates. It's like the two magnets that do this. And so by putting, putting that gray lavender and then maybe coming in here and putting a stronger orange kind of you know next to it, it just it makes it vibrate. Does that make sense? So the, the highlights just fascinate me. Do you often be true confident? Um not entirely. So a five thousand. So when Jeremy painted the sixty five hundred K bulb, that's a really cold light, and so his his um, highlights would really throw white, right? Where a five thousand is a little bit warmer. So instead of like um, white or having a blue, because blue would be the complement of orange, which would bring out the copper. So it's a little bit warmer. That order that I see around my highlight is more in a cool violet rather than a cool blue. Does that make sense? Because it's a little bit warmer than a 65 pound. So this right now is probably enough for me to want to then go to um, the, uh, the flowers. Not that I'm done with it, but I'm really starting to get a sense of of sh shininess. Let's go back. And there's a lot of glare right now because of the light coming in from the window. Um, I'll use a fan brush. So all the, all of my shadow strokes, I want to be really calm and quiet. I say I like to. Um, I want my shadows to be a whisper, and I want my lights to do the talking. So I will come back here with the fan brush and we'll kind of knock down some of this, the ridges um, in the shadowy area. I'm not going to do it here because I want to continue to build up that texture. So 
Uh, and, and this is what I was talking about yesterday in judging, that you do have a variety of, of brushwork. Not everything is just blended to the same level. Does that make sense? You have to have some quiet spots, you know, louder areas that speak and quieter spots that let, let your brain and your eye have a rest with them. Okay, so let's move on to flowers. And this is so, this is where I'll start picking up another set of brushes, you know, one dark and one light. So I'll have a brush for the white, uh, the white flowers, I'll have a brush for the pink flowers, I'll have a brush for the copper. So that if I'm painting in a flower and I see something about the copper that's bothering me, I don't want to rinse out my brush and turf and pick up a new mix. I just look for my, my copper brush. And so by the end of the day, I have like 15 brushes in this hand and, and then I'm, I'm cramping. And, <laughs> All right, I have a little bit more yellowy green. This area. Start off with. Um, and for, for speed sake, um, normally what I'll do is I'll work within an area, like I'll, I'll work this and this and this to a, an area and then move around. I'm a puzzle piece painter. I like if they're puzzle pieces of puzzles that I'm putting together. I don't start with one flower and finish it and then go put it on to another flower and finish it. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, I'm, I'm a puzzle piece. I need to put a few pieces here, a few pieces here, 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 until eventually I'm seeing, I'm, I'm organizing the whole painting as a whole. Does that make sense? So. I think I'm going to use it on the brush. Don't you think that really adds to the feeling? Yeah. You know, artists that paint, when they try to finish a flower or finish one part of the painting, you know, sometimes it just becomes so much about that. You lose sight of the whole. Right. I, I don't see that in your work at all. Like, it's very cohesive and has oh, okay. a beautiful sense of unity. I'll, I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm not. I'm not making that up. <laughs> um, I had a thought and then I went out of my brain. Oh, no. Slap you. She's so good. She's good. She's already. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I think it comes also from um, I am majorly ADD. You know, um, I think a lot of women are, but as as artists, I think we're generally a little bit. We have some attention deficit disorder. So I, I work in an area and I get kind of bored and I'm, I'm anxious to search somewhere else. So I'm constantly jumping around. It's you know when you're when we're filming me, it's kind of hard because the camera's going. Where is she now? <laughs> Liz, it's amazing to see you using such a small brush yet to block in such a large area. I mean, it, the way you're manipulating your paintbrush, it's just moving from one to the next to this to scumbling. That's really fun to see. Um, but this is a stage that I absolutely adore. Absolutely adore. I can't even tell you how much fun I have. It's the finish that, <laughs> you know, you just never know. Um, Whether it's done or not, can you make it better? The one thing that COVID did, uh, which was one, COVID was actually really beneficial for artists. Um, people stayed home, they weren't spending money on trips to Europe or whatever, on cruises, and they bought art. The last few years have been really, really good for artists, but it also helped us with shows canceling and workshops canceling. It allowed us to kind of slow down a little bit and live with our pieces a little bit more. Instead of like hurrying up and getting it done and shipping off to our gallery, it's, it's been wonderful living with the paintings a little bit more. And I think we, Shannon and I were talking about this like the last couple of years, we feel like we have leveled up um, because we've had that ability just to live with the paintings and not rushing out the door kind of thing. Whoops, that's, so that's, that's too green. I'm going to make a really warm gray lavender. 
um, in some of these shadowy areas or petals that are a little bit further back. And you know, it might change. I nothing again, nothing right now is scaring me. What would scare you then? <laughs> like what would be a mark or something? My son going to war, that would scare me. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's why I, 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 you know, I used to say like it's, it's just paint, people. Like you know, that's, it's not something to be scared of. Your son going off to war, that's something to be scared of. Or you know, World War Three, that's something to be scared of. Or health problems, that's something to be scared of. Pain is not something to be scared of. Now I'm sitting back up a little bit Oh, I forgot to turn on my mic. Shanna, we can oh, we're, we're all here. <laughs> Not the oh, so I forgot to turn on my mic. Okay, we can hear yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to the, the Munstead Wood Rose. So I'm using um, alizarin and a little bit of French terrain right now. This is a really difficult color to get, those deep, deep fuchsia colors. So that quinacridone rose or permanent rose is a nice color to have on your palette. And um, did you turn it on now? Will I turn it on now? Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> clap, clap. <laughs> Oh, that's something I never do. Forget to turn on the mic. That's something Shanna would forget to do. So one thing I have found um, beneficial is when you're dealing with bright colors like this future colored rose is to you know come back and wipe out so that you can get um, you can put a pure color down on a dried surface as opposed to putting a pure color on maybe a color that's a little bit muddy. Where are we on time? It is 10.24. Oh, oh, well, we got started late, right? At home, I have my um, iPads, iPad set for 30 minutes. So at the end, when it goes dark, that's a signal for me to take a break and walk away. So, yeah. So I am trying to just mass in really simply right now a light and shadow pattern. I do use my finger quite a bit. Um, to smush things around, soften edges. So um. I'm really trying to simplify and I squint and if I see, um, if I squint and two petals be, are, become one light shape, then I mass it in as one light shape. If I squint and I see more of a mass of a dark, that all gets massed in as dark and then I come on top of that and find um, little areas that I can convince you that maybe there's a, a separation of petals. And you can if you also watch how I paint. I, I, t I use one or two strokes and I stop and I look. I take one or two strokes and I stop and I look. I, in teaching, I see people, they'll look and then they're up here for 15 minutes. And I don't know about you, but my, my, um, my brain isn't that good to remember that much. So I stop and I look. I stop and I look.
and I'll work on our rows for a little bit and then I might come back and you know move to another one because I need to give my eye a little bit of a break from that area. Um, I always kind of liken our, our paintings to the mistakes that we make, we get used to them. It's like walk into a room that somebody's passed gas and it smells really bad and you go, oh wow, that's, that's really bad. But if you've been in the room for a while, <laughs> you, get, you get used to the smell, right? You don't, it, you don't notice the smell anymore. It's the same thing with painting. If you, if you look at the mistake for too long, it just it doesn't look like a mistake. So I'm trying to... Um, I'm never going to make you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got all kinds of jokes. So this particular peony is a difficult one because it's facing the light, um, which is probably one of the hardest ways to paint a flower because there's so many petals and it goes light shadow, light shadow, light shadow, light shadow. It's really difficult to, to create a form within a flower that's facing directly into the light. So you really have to um, simplify There's a deeper yellow tone deep in the center. A little darker. And I, I love that color because it kind of it picks up from the copper. So that's that's really nice, I think. So if I've done my job right in the initial block in, and I, um, I don't think I say, said this, but I'm really, when I go to the block in, I'm looking for m more of a shadowy color because I'm keeping my paint thin. So if I mass it in in shadow, all I have to do is come and find the light shape, okay? So I'm not one that, find, that works hard to find the shadow shape perfectly and then find the light shape perfectly. My brain, um, if I'm, my brain, the way it works, if I just kind of more relax with the shadow shape and it's not even distinct, when I come and find the light shape, the light shape makes the shadow shape. Does that make sense? And then I can carve in darks around it with the greens and, and things like that. So it's just a way of my brain not having to work so hard in finding shapes. I do this kind of thing a lot. So like if I just, I don't know if you see what I just did there coming through and just doing this, then I, that, there's a petal there that's in shadow. I can just come and find, find the light shape. Yeah. And, and that petal's kind of done. I'm trying to, again, put more emphasis on, on the lights than the darks. Okay, so it's time I'm wanting to come in with some greenery and carve in. I love, I love painting in negative shapes. Um, I think you all know that when you're seeing things negatively, you're drawing better than if you're drawing positive. So in order, in order to make this stuff work, see, even if I do that, it gets a little bit of green into that petal, and that's going to be really beautiful, hopefully. But let's go back to our dark green, which was transparent oxide red and viridian. Oh 
more green. So when people say to you, you're being so negative, <laughs> do you take that as a call? Yeah. Better than being called a witch. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This is the best kind of friends. They are. Scott knows I love him. I've had several opportunities to do a zinger so far. Just oh. I have resisted. <laughs> so wow. Thank you. Go ahead, Scott, give it your best. <laughs> I'm actually impressed you explained your process as good as you can do it. <laughs> um. Well, I paint a lot better when I don't have to talk it through, but because it's, you know, have you ever seen the test, like the ballerina or the ho horse walking backwards or forwards? Yes. So, so if you see the horse walking backwards, you're a right brain person. If you see it walking forward, you're a left brain person. Well, the only way I see that horse walk is backwards. I, I always joke and say that between Shan and I, we probably have half a left brain because we're just so into our right brain all the time and when you're talking you really you're you're more into your the the left side of your brain which is the more scientific analytical and the right side is the more creative side so it's um it's a balance for sure but. so far this painting's walking the right way is it is, <laughs> what time is it how much more time do i have it's 10 you still got plenty of time Okay, so you know what the difference between a male artist and a female artist is? So a male artist is back here going, man, I'm hoping this painting is reading right. And a female artist is going, man, I hope these jeans don't make my butt look fat. Why don't you stand up next to me? It make me look really thin. <laughs> I'm kidding, Rob. <Mom. laughs> I hope you're enjoying it so far. Nobody said yes. Yeah. <laughs> I do like to have fun when we're when we're painting. I crack Shanna up. Well, I never thought if you'd told me 15 years ago I'd be living in Ogden, Utah, I would I would have told you you were smoking crack or something. But I abs I absolutely love it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point where I want to add some more background and so that I can soften edges into the background and then I'm going to go back into my, my copper. I'm going to give myself a little bit of, of a break on the flowers. Um, they're not nearly done, but they're, 
they're coming. May we take a picture of this stage of the painting? Yeah, of course. Let me let me just do one more little stroke here. Yeah, go ahead. Gonna, we'll take a little bit of a break. But um, for time, I'm just going to go ahead and put some more background. Also, when I'm the background is a good um, brain relaxer for me. When I've been working on flowers for a while and I start to get brain dead, I'll go to the background because that's a little bit more relaxed for my brain to do. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say, "Well, I don't understand why you don't put your background first. I was always told to put your background in first. Well, um, I. I want my background to relate to my flowers. Right. And if I do the background first, then I almost have to make the flowers relate to the background, and I don't want to do that. So plus experience, I know, you know, I know where I want to go with my value range or and, and what that's going to do to the the flower value range. Does does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just using the same three colors again, black, ochre, and alizarin. <laughs> Liz has done some beautiful high key still lifes as well. She's done some they, people think high key are really easy because you're just staying in this compressed value range, but to be honest, high key is difficult. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. Your portrait of the niece is stunning. Oh, did he show it? I asked him to oh. show it. So before we go, he gave me you could show us. I, yeah, I will. Yeah, and then I paint my other nieces and nephews, and they're always disappointed because it doesn't quite look like Caitlin. <laughs> She is. She's, she's just a beautiful soul inside and out. When I painted that portrait, she was eight months pregnant with her first son, Jack. She now has four boys. <laughs> I wonder why. She's a, a good, good mom. She is. So it, he's got a son, Patrick, that's a good artist, too. His son, Patrick, is a luthier. Luthier? Luthier? luthier. We have, um, well, Rob's the smartest in the family. He's the lawyer. Um, I'm the artist. We, My little brother's a, a writer. Being what? a lawyer would argue against me being the smartest. <laughs> right. Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but anyway. my, bro my little brother's a book publisher and a writer. So I'm changing the value and the temperature of this just a little back here to give a sense of some atmosphere behind the vase. 
Whether it stays this color, I don't know. I might make it a little greener. Okay, and so this is, you can see I kind of left a little cheat line there around around this peony back here, but this is this is where I take, I absolutely love, 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 love <laughs> doing, doing this and creating some really beautiful soft edges. So that that when I smudge that out right there, so it's picked up the color of the background, but the paint is really thin. And then when I carve around background around it, that paint, that petal really does receive it. It also looks really translucent. Um, and so it's, it's just one of my, you know, favorite things to do. I have so much fun, and I know it's probably not healthy, but I'm not going to go and eat french fries right now. But this is where, you know, I'm painting negatively, creating some beautiful negative shapes as opposed to painting positive shapes. So that needs to be a little bit more in shadow. So for me, it just, it makes sense just to pull a little bit of background into that petal. And I don't like, um, I, I want to feel there's atmosphere around that vessel. So I am going to come, and I've got the light here. Make it a little warmer. I'm going to come and put it back here as well. Just maybe not as much, and that's going to help with that atmospheric quality. Air behind the vessel. So I, I honestly paint this fast um, at home. Um, I, I just I can get that this block in stage within less than an hour at home, and then I take a break and then I slow down. But um, and this is once I get this part done, this would probably be the stage as long as I've I've softened some edges and I don't have any hard edges that bother me or nothing's really jumping out at me as being completely uh, wrong. Then I'll set this aside, go cut some more roses, set it up, and start again. She's usually got three going right before I even got my job. <laughs> some more roses, you mean start a different arrangement? I start a different arrangement, yeah, yeah. And then do you let it dry to do finishing, or...? Um, a lot of times, it, you know, like I said yesterday, the, the paint in U, here in Utah really dries quite fast. Um, so it's usually pretty dry even the next day. And, but that's why I may even take my fan brush and go over the whole thing and make everything really soft mm -hmm. and then come back the next day and just find a few edges. I'm one that prefers um, more soft edges than hard edges. At least that's my goal. I don't know if I have, I accomplish that all the time. Um, I, you know, I think it's kind of a feminine thing that as women, you know, we like softer edges.
A good example of the masculine and feminine to me is Scott Burdick and Susan Lyon. Yeah. Susan Lyon's edges are really, really soft and ethereal, and, and Scott's um, are a lot more harder and more masculine. Both are incredible painters, um, but their edge quality are completely opposite. Where was I? Not there. What you're saying is, I'm more feminine. <laughs> <laughs> so when it is dry and you're coming back, do you um, do anything to it, or do you add um, oil? Or? Yeah, it depends. So if I've used a lot of umber, um, those are tones, that, and the paint has sunken in. Then I'll just I'll, what I actually do is just take a paper towel, I dip it in the Neil McGilp, and I kind of oil out if it's really dry. Um, a lot of times, like the painting that you see, the, the, the yellow roses, um, that was, all of that other than the rug was all a la prima. That was in one sitting. The then I got exhausted and the next day I came back and finished the rug. The one with the dried sunflower heads, that was, that was probably a three day painting. That took me um, three days to get it to where I wanted to go with that particular painting. I I just absolutely love the debris. <laughs> but the, and they're great um, directional tools, all these little loose pedals. Um, they're, they help lead your eye around. But also for me, it symbolizes life. Um, life is never perfect. And um, life can be really messy. And it can fall apart sometimes. And so when those, those petals fall onto the ground, that's what that represents to me, is my life that has fallen apart many times. And, but I put it back together. So it's very symbolic. And so um, you're probably going to come into the painting this way. And so these, even these little petals, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably maybe draw you around this way. And I don't want to go petal, 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 that kind of thing, so they're evenly across. But I want your eye to come here and then come in and, you know, maybe there's a few little petals that, that bring you back up. So I think when I'm doing composition, I kind of think in terms of letters, an S shape, a C shape, a T shape, an L shape. So you know, you have this, you know, I do a lot of S-shaped compositions. Even if it's a sideways S, it comes in from the side and swings up and comes around. So you have this beautiful sideways S or, you know, a T. Um, so. I'll, I'll give you a hint on selling your own paintings. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth just said, I've noticed in galleries for many, many years, watching people look at a painting I had a couple one time and the guy looked at me and he says, I just, uh, I don't understand this painting and it was a big floral piece. He says, I just don't see what I'm supposed to be looking at. And so I said, well, just take, take me through what you see. Where does your eye go? And so he kind of did this beautiful journey through this painting. And uh, I said, all right, so let's go back and, and redo what you just did. Look at what the artist did with this little note of color over here. Look at this shape here. And I said, you are an art connoisseur because you did exactly what the artist wanted you to do. And he just stood there for a second, looked at his wife and said, we have to buy this painting. <laughs> and, and it's, but sometimes just a few little things like what Elizabeth just said will, will resonate with somebody and help them understand that they're actually appreciating art in a way maybe they didn't even understand they could. Scott is um, a great promoter of artists and does a great job at selling art. I have some very, 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 very heart touching experience in selling Elizabeth's work. <laughs> well, why don't you share one while I, so I can just concentrate? <laughs> Well, I would be happy to if you want me to. Yes. Uh, I had one of her paintings up in Jackson Hole one, at one time. And I think at the time was probably one of the largest paintings I think she had done. Yeah, it was. And uh, I was in the gallery on a Saturday morning, 
and the couple came in about 11.30 and uh, started walking around the gallery and they both stopped in front of this painting and it had a big, what was it, the big samovar? The bronze, yeah, the Russian but, samovar. I mean, it was just a gorgeous piece. And the guy immediately walked over to me and said, do you have a tape measure? And I said, yeah. He said, I walked back and then found his wife in front of the painting in tears, which is always a really good sign. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I, hang, I, I usually do the measurement myself, but I just handed the tape measure to him and stood back. And uh, he measures this painting on the outside of the, outside the frame. And I see the tear coming down his cheek. And he looked at his wife and said, it's perfect. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go get an invoice right now. <laughs> but they were talking, and I just let them have this moment together. And uh, then he walked back with the tape measure and said, we'll buy the painting. And I said, great. So we did the transaction. And I said, OK, I have to know. <laughs> You know what's going on, and uh, the wife then went to explain to me that her grandmother owned the samovar, like was in the painting, and this reminded her of her, and she was just such a special person, blah blah blah. And I thought that's great, and I looked at him and I said, okay, you said it's perfect, and he said, well, I'm a I'm a builder, and he says we built a home three years ago, and in the main living area, I built an inset into the wall, thinking at some point in time we would find a piece of artwork that would, was justified being in that space. And he says, we've been looking for three years, and this painting happens to be within the perfect inch, inch. I mean, he says, it just fits like I built this house for this painting. And I thought, well, there's two different motivations for buying this painting, which was really cool. And I said, okay, so I said, how did you end up here today? And he said, well, that's kind of an interesting story, too. And uh, uh, I said, well, tell me. And they said, they live here in Salt Lake. And uh, he said, they woke up early on Saturday morning, didn't have a thing to do. He wanted to spend some time with his wife that day. So she suggested that they go to her to their favorite breakfast place in Montpelier, Idaho for breakfast. So they got in the car and went to Montpelier and uh, got to Montpelier and then they decided to take a drive up through Star Valley just to see uh, the colors and whatnot. And when they got there, they decided, well, Jackson's only 45 minutes away. Let's go to Jackson. So they get up to Jackson and she says, well, where should we go? And then he said, well, Let's go, let's go to Lakes. We'll hit them first and see what they've got. And it's just the chain of events to get them there, in their experience, and I'll let Liz tell you what I I had to call Liz and tell Liz what happened because he and she was just adamant that they were led to Jackson that day to find part of the painting that and she had done it. A good story. And I have, and I have my, my opinions about how they got inspired to get there, and I'm sure Liz does too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, those things happen all the time in the gallery. They really do. So I always, I always kind of challenge artists. I often hear artists say, I paint what I want to paint. Well, paint what you think that person that's gonna just fall in love with it is hoping to feel when you paint that painting. And it could be one person, it could, you know, I've had paintings where I've had 500 people want it. And there's a wide variety, but there is that connection. And I I, I also tell artists, make sure whatever, you, whatever type of relationship you have with the gallery that you get that kind of feedback on what, what motivated the person that bought it to buy it. And I, one of my favorite things to do was send texts or emails or make a phone call to the artist and say, someone's so just buying, sometimes just a short little paragraph, this is what captured their interest in buying it. Because I want you to know that. 
Shanna, why don't, while I'm still trying to concentrate, this is and then now I got to slow down and my brain has to think a little harder. Why don't you talk about the energy of art while I, is that okay? Well, I myself have been witness to lots of people coming in and looking at Liz's work and bursting into tears and stuff. Pretty amazing, but I think it's because you're, you're a very emotional painter and people feel that. And the coolest thing about art is you have the emotion in the soul of the artist and the emotion in the soul of, of the viewer coming together on this tangible thing. And it's so strange to when you start talking to the people that buy your work, um, how much you have in common that, that you would have never known. But that piece of art brings you together, people together, and there's so many commonalities that sometimes it's shocking. But I do believe there's quite a bit of divine intervention myself. We always talk about um, how art, you know, we, we're painting this for us at this moment in time because we're having fun and we just love painting. But energy is shared. So we tell it, okay, universe, now send this energy out and find the person that needs this painting to be healed. Because I, I can tell you 100% art heals. If you don't know my story, my husband passed away in 2007. It was devastating, absolutely devastating. And um, I found out that the only time I wasn't in my grief was when I was painting. Because that's, I, that you're so focused and so it, it, it helped me um, with the grief journey, if you, if you would. But um, we, we say, okay, universe, find the people. And that, that universe just weaves its way through the tapestry of life and finds the person that it needs to go to. Another really quick story is we were, Shannon and I were up at the Russell, um, Great Falls, Montana. We did that sh show for like 15 years. And I painted a little pomegranate, just a simple little broken pomegranate. You know, it's like a six by eight. And um, it actually had gone to a couple galleries and didn't sell. And I'm like, I, I think this is a really sweet painting. Why isn't anybody buying the painting? And we were up there and this, so I'm, the pomegranate's on this side of the wall. These ladies walk in and the one lady's walking like this and Shanna's paintings are on here and this side and my paintings are on this side. And she says, you know, I wish somebody would paint a pomegranate. My husband, we, he proposed to me at a restaurant that there was this pomegranate painting above our table when my husband proposed to me. And she goes, <laughs> and she starts crying. And the friend quickly left the and I actually told her that I already had somebody interested in it. That's a really great sales tool to make them pull the trigger. But the friend went out of the room and called her husband and said, You have to paint you have to buy this painting for your wife. So he called me and bought the painting. So I put a red dot on it. And she came back in and she goes, oh. She was devastated because she was gonna buy the painting. She saw the red dot. And I said, Well, yeah, it just sold. I saw and she's crying. And the friend said, your husband bought it for you. <laughs> so, oh, I mean, just sweet. simple little painting like that you know, mm -hmm. and how much that energy can bring to, to people. Okay. It's due, what time are we? We are at 11.05. And I was supposed to end at 11.45, but we're going to go till noon because mm -hmm. I started a little late. Is that all right with everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, that was right, 11.45? I thought you said 11.30. Oh, that's right. 11.45. I'm going to go to 11.45 because we didn't start till 9.30. Okay. That sounds good. All right. If you went to noon, would you be fined or something? Would I get it done? Is that what you're... No. Would the paint police come in and put <laughs> that uh, Dang, those paint police. You're under, under painting arrest. Yeah. <laughs> uh. When we moved to the state of Washington, I decided we and figured it was going to be permanent. We updated our will and the trust and all that kind of stuff and went into the attorney's office to uh, sign the documents. And before I signed, and my wife signed, the attorney turns to my wife and says, Deanne, this is your chance. 
if there's anything that you want, expect, or demand of Scott, let's put it into the document right now. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> and uh, she thought for a minute and she said, all right, I want you to write this right into it. And, uh, and she, she tells him, I want him to go through and video every painting in his collection, where he bought it, when he bought it, why he bought it, and the story about the artist and the painting. I love and, that. And it's been fun document. Um, I said, you know, what could I say? So he literally hand wrote it into the documents and then handed it to me and I signed it. And I have to admit, I was a little bit I was shocked that my wife has finally, over all of these 42 years of being together with me, realizes that they're just not pictures on the wall. They're, they're stories. And it's some of them are more artist driven than even the painting itself. And so I've actually had fun with my cell phone going painting, painting. Every once in a while, I think, oh, I, I still got 20 more or 30 more or 40. I keep buying art. That's a terrible thing. But it's been a really fun document. And then uh, I share them with my kids who, when they were teenagers, I would take them to Jackson Hole. And whenever a painting came, I would uncreate it, unpack it, set it against the wall. And then I would purposely walk out of the room. And I hear my four teenage girls treating my art collection like I did baseball cards when I was a kid. <laughs> Bartering and trading, ooh, I really like this new one. I'll trade you this one that we knew was one at the date. And so I did ask when we did the will to my kids, so do I have to say anything about who gets what when I die? They said, no, we got that all figured out. Uh, but uh, and just this morning talking about often, I mean, I had a great, I had a great, mentor is a team on how to paint watercolors, Richard Van Wagner. And uh, I would I would just be challenged all the time. Do I want to go play baseball or do I want to go to a studio and paint? And my friends, including his son, who was one of my best friends, never understood the, you know, well, of course you want to go play baseball. Of course you want to go play basketball. Of course you want to go do this. And it was like, oh, I want to go paint. And, uh, I bought I bought a painting when I was 15 from him. Uh, when I was 14, uh, I worked all summer at this god awful landscaping job uh, and made 500 bucks. And I bought a rifle and a shotgun because that's what my dad did. And they were so proud of me because they, you know, they weren't in a situation to go out and buy their son a rifle and a shotgun. Way to go, son. We're so proud of you. This is going to be so great. You know, my dad was just so hyper and so excited. My mom was just... Next summer, I go do the same job again, make 550 bucks, and spend it all on this incredible, beautiful 36 by 48 watercolor painting. Mm -hmm. And my parents thought I was nuts. You worked all summer, and you should be saving money for this, this, and you know, they were just beside themselves that they thought I had wasted a whole summer. And uh, oh fast forward, oh, probably 30 years. I, they were over to dinner one time and we had a wonderful Sunday afternoon and we were just sitting by the dining room table ready to have dessert. And I saw my mom glance up at that paint, which was hanging right there in the dining room. And then my dad glanced up and then my mom glanced back up and I just couldn't resist. And I just looked at them both and I said, you know, mom and dad, I wonder where that, that rifle and shotgun are at. <laughs> and because I, I don't know what, I don't even know what happened to him after my dad passed away. But that painting is a part of me. And I love walking into the, you know, walking into my that room in my house and seeing it. And the nice reminder of my mom and dad who have both passed away, and somebody who really just captivated me and the love of art, both from doing it and buying it and appreciating it. And that's what that's the connection you're allowing people to have. And it's it's fun to watch. And. You know, collectors become collectors because they get the bug of having those experiences. And the challenge is getting them started. Uh, I mean, I'm in a state now that just isn't used to having original art on the wall. 
But getting them to buy that first piece is, is so much fun. <laughs> All right, now you can talk to you. It's impressive. I still love the painting as much today as I did then. I, um, a few years ago, I started giving my children, I'd let them choose a painting for their collection um, every year so that, you know, by the time I die, they've got a, they're looking forward to the day I die, let's just say. <laughs> I'm kidding, they're not, but it's, it's fun to um, do a painting and I'll post it on social media or something and have one of my kids say, Mama, that's the one I want this year. And... Um, so that that feels real. That feels really good that they understand the value of art. You know, we got to teach the younger generation about the value of art. So, all right. It's amazing what art does. I have friends that are collectors that say, "I can do without my nice car. I can do without one of my houses, but I can't. I can't live without my art." Mm -hmm. That's why it's really, really important. It's I. Really there are, um, there are certain people that just don't get it. My dad was one of them. My dad was as left brain as they come, very successful <laughs> businessman. And he, and one time we're at the Russell and some people just bought two paintings. They spent like five, seven thousand dollars with me. And, and my dad comes walking in and he, and he adored me. Don't get me wrong. And he was very proud of me. But he walked in. I said, Dad, these, this is so and so. They just bought these two paintings. And he goes over and he looks at the price and he puts his hand on their shoulder and go, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get how you can spend Holy that much money on a painting. But I'm sure glad you did because now I don't have to loan my daughter money. And I'm looking, I'm going, when was the last time you loaned? I was 16 the last time you loaned me money. But um, he was proud of me, but he just did not get the art thing. He didn't get it. So, all right. I'm liking it. Me too. It's beautiful. So if you notice, I don't even have the image up anymore. So now I'm just, I'm looking at interesting um, shapes around the parameter, my hard um, and soft edges. Um, the, you know, when I blow stuff out like that, the, the thing I love about that and what that kind of helps relate to people is that it's a still life, but these are live flowers and they move. And so if everything is really hard and stiff, um, the Dutch master florals, I look at them and I'm like, I'll never be able to paint that good. I mean, they're just incredible paintings, but they are, they're also so stiff. Um, there's no movement and there's as much um, detail in the little ant that's crawling over <laughs> here as there is in the main uh, flower, if you know what I mean. And they're beautiful paintings, but they don't, they don't excite me the way like going and seeing a sergeant and seeing his brushwork and those edges. That is, I remember an epiphany I had, and, and I was a lot tighter in my decorative art days. I was a lot tighter, and it's been a gradual procession to be a little bit looser and looser and, and a little bit more painterly. But um, Sargent was having an exhi exhibit in Washington, D.C., and so um, a bunch of us, we took a field trip to, to go see the Sargent exhibit at the Smithsonian, and um, I just, he, you know, Sargent painted huge, and there was the, the one painting uh, it was the little girl standing there? There was and there was a tea cart with a tea set, silver tea set, and I don't, the whole family setting, right, with the couch and everything. And across the room, I'm looking at that, going, "That is the most stunning silver I have ever seen in my life." It just, it the shine was unbelievable. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, how did he do that?" And I go up now, I'm I'm my 18 inches apart, right, and I'm looking at going. It's nothing but unrecognizable blobs of paint. Mm -hmm. It was it was an epiphany, and that's when the light bulb went on mm -hmm. um, went on for me. So, just it was just amazing. Okay. What's the time? 7.16. The 
the thing about this copper vessel, it's got some really beautiful patina on it, some um, kind of turquoise, and I've painted it enough time that I kind of know where it is. I can tell my symmetry is off a little bit. Uh, it's also losing some of its copper patina, so the, the pewter is coming through, and there's it's a beautiful silvery color over on this side, and I think that's going to be a really nice cool note with all of the warms. Um, you know, normally at home, I would have I would have stepped back a lot more. You know, I'm constantly going like this in my painting, and I do have a mirror um, behind me that so I can just turn around and look at the mirror and see the painting in reverse, so I can see if my symmetry is off. Um, Yeah, sure. Now we all have to have mirrors in our studios. Yes. Well, you need to check for paint on your face. Do I have paint on my face? Oh. I'm sure I do. I mean, look at me. I am the messiest painter that there is. There's one time we were filming, and I um, I was filming by myself for our Inspired to Paint, and I go in and I upload all the footage and I'm editing it and there's a big red streak on my, on my cheek and I'm just painting and talking and so where's Shanna when you need her to tell you you got paint on your face? Um, the interesting thing I also find is when I paint fast like this, there and I, sometimes I think my demos are some of my best work because I um, I can't I don't have time to overthink everything. I'm just I'm making really fast decisions and living with them. Um, but uh, what am I trying to say? It's there's an honesty to a demo like this. It's fresh, it's loose, and it's and it's honest. It's what I could do in two hours. And I think there's there's some a lot of times where I think, God, that that's gosh, that just that's really beautiful. But I think I can make it better in the next day. I've lost that freshness or that that honesty that I got that particular day. So it's a it's a balance on whether do I go back or do I leave it that fresh. And you know, I don't know. If somebody knows the answer, let me know. If you figured it out. I'm going to create a little bit of like cast shadows coming over here, so a little bit more of an interesting shape. Um, I want a really soft edge where the table line meets the background. And I might, I might put in these little cast shadows and I might take them out, I don't know. I'll just wait and see.
So other than when I do rugs, like the rug in the background there, um, I'm one that really, kind of really likes to have my backgrounds fairly quiet. Um, the, the, the more dynamic this is, the more I can get away with more dyma dynamic of a background, but my background can't be more exciting than the, the, the elements within the painting. So, um, although I think there's some beautiful brushwork here, it's going to be even more beautiful if I can come in here and calm the background down. And what brush is that? This is just the fan, but I'm just kind of... This is a fairly smooth canvas as well, so um, any, it, you know, it's going to hang in somebody's home and it's probably going to be lit from above. So the last thing I want to do is have a, a big strong horizontal stroke that's going to catch the light and really kind of draw too much attention to the background. So I, I use I use stroke directional um, directions to my advantage. You know, if I want something really quiet, I'm going to make sure my brush strokes go down. And if I want something exciting, I'm going to go um, horizontal. I'm always going uh, horizontal across the form because that's really helping you create that volume this way. And again, I'm, you know, I'm a, a vertical stroke kind of helps signify height of something and the horizontal stroke helps depict form. So and when it comes to bases, I'm always going across the form in the light and I'm going down in the shadow, if that makes sense. So and right now the light's coming from the side and I'm getting ridges of paint, I'm getting glare, but if it was lit from above, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that. I'm going to add, um, so I'm going to add a little bit of reflected quality to this vessel. And a lot of times what I like to do is instead of add paint, I like to kind of like take my brush and pull some stuff out rather than add paint. I think that adds a more reflected quality. Um, ref reflections should, I, I don't believe reflections should be thick in, in the amount of paint. I think they should be soft edged. Um, otherwise they'll detract from the element that's causing the reflection. So sometimes I think just coming in here and pulling some paint out and softening creates a nicer reflection than if I were to add paint. And um, the more value change I have around, you know, when you want, when you're wanting to make something really shiny, the more value change I can have around here versus around the other areas, the shinier the object's going to appear. Whoops, I was, that's what I was doing. I was doing this cast shadow. Okay, well, I think, um, what do you think? <laughs> I don't like that tone right there. Shanna, what do you think? She stepped out to take a phone call. Oh, okay. But, uh, so I know whose home I want to see that hang in. I'd like to buy it. Really? Yes. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you. And, but the caveat is I get to have the video. Oh, of course. Along with it, but I would love my dad. Well, that makes me feel good. Oh. Do I get to tweak it a little bit? <laughs> you can do whatever you you're the you're the creator. I'm the boss. I can right. do whatever, let it dry, varnish it. Yeah. Okay. Worry, but I know it's the perfect spot with the perfect lighting and it's gonna do exactly what you hope to do. Awesome. Thank you. Well how often does that happen during Christmas? <laughs> Not not a lot with somebody like Scott. That's a that's a big compliment. Thank you. 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 Thank
people will walk in my home and, and they'll say, oh, are all these your paintings? I say, no, no. Like I have, I think I have one of mine hanging. The rest are all everybody else's because I just love being Im immersed in art. So. Well, it's made more special to me having spent many visits in your own garden. I mean, it's, it's amazing visiting her studio. I do have um, a... And, and at different times of the year, yeah. you get to experience birth and death and everything in between. Yeah. Well, in fact, I don't know. I, I get a lot of negative comments on social media. <laughs> I, I don't know why that is, but I get attacked a lot. Um, yeah, my spatula technique. Somebody made a comment on the sunflower head that it would have been better to have fresh sunflowers. What? And um, <laughs> I've painted a lot of sunflowers, but the the sunflower heads, again, I, because I've experienced a lot of grief in my life, my brother died, my husband died, um, the, the emotion of life and that circle of life is very real and very personal to me. And the sunflower heads, you know, and the older I get, I kind of like, I'm a sunflower head. I'm, I'm getting up there in age. I've <laughs> lost my, I've lost my, my petals, my brightness, my youth. Um, but I, I still have something to give to the world. And those sunflower heads, as scraggly as they are, those, those seeds are going to fall and they're going to plant, they're going to root. And the next year we're going to have beautiful sunflowers. And it's just like our kids. I have a grandbaby now. How awesome is that? It's just the most awesome thing. And I did a painting once. Um, it was called The Circle of Life. And it was roses coming down. It was in the same, the same pot, um, pink and fuchsia roses. And it was four pink roses. And one of the pink roses was, was laying right here, um, folding down. And the highlight was kind of like the reflection was dribbling down. And I had a candle over here with, with a light that was giving off warmth. And I got a lot of people saying, "Why? I don't understand the candle. Why would you put a candle? That kind of thing. But that painting was really symbolic to me. That candle, that light represented me. And even though my light is dimming, I'm still trying to give off my warmth and my light to the world and to my children. And those four pink roses were my three children, my daughter-in-law. And her, the, the main rose represented my daughter-in-law that had given birth to my grandbaby, Georgia, to Georgia Grace. So she was pouring out her life force to a new, new generation. I, I get kind of choked up in the painting sold and I wish I had it back because it was really emotional for me for that painting. Um, but I got a lot of critique, I got a lot of criticism on that painting. But the people that bought it absolutely loved it. And it, it's in a good home, so. And do they know the story? I, yes, I good. told them, yeah. They were major collectors of mine. They love my work. But I told her the, the sim symbolism and they loved it even more. So anyway, it's, it's been an honor. Um, it's been fun. I, I hope you learned something. Um, so thank you. Thank you.